afternoon, Ms. Welcome to this afternoon interaction with Ambassador Dr. Minister Pradeen, uh, someone who is uh, familiar to many of us as well. He was a uh, regular at many of our functions uh, during his term as ambassador uh, uh, to India of the EU. Um, and um, of course, uh, he was, I was just mentioning to him the last time I met him, I met him as His Excellency. He still remains His Excellency, it's only the ambassador that's changed to minister. Uh, he knows us well, he knows India well, he's um, uh, in many ways uh, worked and survived uh, the, the mandarins of South Bloc the bureaucracy of India, and certainly the think tankers who are as crazy, if not more. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you back, sir. And uh, uh, you are someone who is intimately engaged on uh, matters of European security, uh, EU security, certainly in, in engagement with NATO, what's happening uh, on that front. And as defense minister, you're also pushing for a, a more robust India-Portugal engagement uh, in the defense sector. Uh, Thank you for joining us, and I would invite you now to speak to us on uh, your brief, which is European security. Many of us would like to know what's happening on that front, and certainly, if I would invite my colleagues thereafter to uh, to quiz the minister on any questions they may have, both on what's happening in the continent and in terms of the bilateral. So over to you, uh, Mr. Kirby. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Samir. Uh, really delighted to be back at the ORF, really glad to be back in India, I'm back in, in Delhi. Um, yesterday evening when, when we arrived, we went for uh, dinner just uh, informally there in Khan Market, and I was thinking as I was walking around, it's like I've never left really. Um, it's really uh, quite special. And uh, this morning I've had the opportunity for a very, very good, uh, extensive, wide-ranging discussion with the Defense Minister, with Nirmala Sitaraman, and um, uh, look forward also to further discussions tomorrow with uh, Ajit Dorval. Um, I, I, will, I will just say a couple of brief words on the, the Portugal-India uh, defense relationship and then go on to talk a little bit about uh, the, I would say, the state of play uh, in a certain amount of churning that is happening in terms of European security, the relationship with NATO, and, um, and the way that the European Union is developing on its, um, its security platform, and then be open to whatever uh, you would like to, to discuss. Um, I should say also thank you very much to ORF, ORF for organizing this at such a, a short notice. I'm delighted to see uh, such a turnout and I'm delighted also to see some familiar faces amongst the turnout. So thank you for, for being here. On the uh, Portugal-India defense relationship, as, uh, as uh, you all can imagine, it's not, um, it's not been, a, 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 it's a fairly modest one. It's not been highly developed. Uh, what we are focusing on at the moment is uh, really bringing our defense industries into much closer contact and, um, and working on um, a context which is changing very rapidly. There is an upsurge in procurement around the world. There is also a changing uh, scenario in terms of capabilities and requirements. Um, technology is transforming every day um, what, uh, what uh, armed forces are requiring in terms of equipment. And um, we, have, uh, we have, therefore, a number of uh, possibilities. And I'm very optimistic after the meeting with uh, Minister Sitaraman about the possibilities of working together. The field of uh, aeronautics, field of uh, shipbuilding. Uh, we have India, of course, is a country with tremendous history uh, of uh, textiles. But, um, but we think that this is also an area where we can be moving forward uh, very, uh, in a very interesting manner because of the technological possibilities that are now opening up in terms of um, uh, protective equipment, uh, clothing, and, and anti-ballistic protection. I'm talking about the use, on the one hand, of nanotechnology, which is quite exciting. It's a sort of a science fiction kind of stuff whereby you have the possibility of developing uh, textiles, um, camouflage, which is the, the clothing equivalent of the stealth planes, which, uh, as you know, are invisible to, 
to radar, or which are very difficult to detect on radar. But uh, so with the use of nanotechnology, we've been developing uh, clothing that is very difficult to detect with uh, ultraviolet and infrared and so on. So um, military personnel have a different, have a, another layer of protection uh, from 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 detection. And uh, so we're interested in working with India on that. Uh, the use of composite materials for for anti-ballistic protection uh, allows for the possibility of uh, helmets and, and other uh, body protection, which is much, much lighter uh, and, and more resistant than, uh, than standard issue. So uh, even in uh, issues so simple as uniforms and, um, and helmets, we find that technology is transforming the scenario. Another um, element to defense industry cooperation is related to what I will speak about in, in a few moments, which is the changing scenario in Europe um, and the, uh, the possibilities of working with India for the European market, working with India also in a manner that fits in with the quite large amounts of um, financing that the European Union is going to be de de dedicating to, um, to defense industries in the next financial cycle. As you know, the European Union works on a seven-year uh, financial cycle. The next uh, one starts in 2020. And for the first time, because the EU has not been a military actor, but for the first time, there will be a considerable amount of money dedicated to security and defense and security procurement. And there are questions still to be worked out, finalized about which countries can participate. European Union countries, of course, but what about third parties? Um, under what circumstances, and the uh, working with Indian uh, defense industries is, in this context, is also uh, related to, to looking at these future possibilities. So those are a few words that I wanted to, to share. We, we spoke about a number of other issues which we have in common, things like uh, the evolving peacekeeping uh, landscape, um, because India, of course, is a very major troop contributing country. We've also been very active in various uh, UN missions, and uh, and this is a changing uh, scenario. But uh, those are just the, the, the few items that I wanted to flag with relation to the uh, India-Portugal um, defense relationship. A few words on NATO, uh, which has just celebrated its 70th anniversary, and, um, and, and from then on to the European Union, and the two are, of course, very much uh, linked. NATO at 70, um, would its founders have recognized it? I would say that uh, certainly the NATO that we have today exists largely because it has been capable of reinventing itself. Uh, the missions that are central missions for, the, for NATO today um, were not present at all at the foundation. Ideas like um, uh, supporting nations to, to rebuild, states to be built up, or uh, fighting terrorism, these were nowhere near the, uh, the, the ideas, the thinking of uh, NATO founders back in 1949. The Soviet Union, of course, disappeared. Uh, and um, when the Soviet Union did disappear, there were uh, many people, line of thinking, important line of thinking, saying, well, there is no more any reason for NATO, so maybe NATO should disappear. It didn't, though. It didn't because, uh, firstly, uh, even though uh, the Soviet Union had disappeared, there really was no desire on part of the NATO member states to dissolve the organization. The idea at the time was, you know, it doesn't do any harm to have it there, so let's, let's keep it. There was no demand for the dissolution of NATO. Secondly, within a few short years, NATO was finding new missions, in particular Bosnia, and then a little bit further down the road, Afghanistan came along. And, and that transformed the kind of activities that NATO uh, was focusing on. And then, uh, a little bit further down the road, we had a resurgent Russia. We had 2014, the annexation of Crimea. And all of a sudden, uh, Russia is back front and center of NATO concerns. So NATO at 70. The, the question of why it's still there is, um, I think, to be explained by the fact that it has managed to uh, adapt itself. It's, uh, you 
and perhaps uh, it's symptomatic of that that NATO has uh, a number of commands and it has two strategic commands uh, one of which is NATO operations uh, the other is um, the transformation transformation strategic command and so in other words it has made transformation into a permanent feature of the organization transformation of course at the level of operations at the level of how uh, how, how mandates are carried out but transformation also in terms of the thinking of what NATO is for and how it responds to changing uh, landscape so NATO at 70, what are the, the challenges now? I would say one challenge, this is uh, very much a matter of uh, public discussion, is keeping the transatlantic relationship up there. Um, here in the uh, Indo-Pacific, you are very much aware of the manner in which uh, American attention has shifted over the last couple of decades to this region of the world. And, um, and away from the Atlantic. Uh, this, was, this is not invented by President Trump. Um, President, under Obama, there was very much uh, present this notion of the, of the pivot uh, to Asia. Uh, but this was somewhat interrupted by the 2014 uh, <coughs> annexation of Crimea and Russian activity in um, Hybrid, promoting hybrids uh, and uh, warfare and so on in, in, uh, in the regions on its, on its borders. So uh, the transatlantic relationship, which under Obama had become a little weaker because it was less central to US strategic thinking, um, then regain, regained centrality with Crimea. But under uh, President Trump, it has come under uh, other kinds of uh, strain, in particular the uh, pressure from the United States administration. Again, something that existed previously, although not in such an intense manner, for the Europeans to take on a higher uh, sense of responsibility for their own uh, defense, and namely to spend more on defense. Um, this is accepted by Europeans. There is a notion that, yes, we need to be uh, spending more on defense. We need to be taking on more of the burden ourselves. Uh, an inevitable corollary of this is that European defense industries are uh, also becoming more robust because the spending is partly on European defense industries. That in itself has also become a, f a source of a certain degree of friction because um, there is a sense from American <coughs> level of American commercial interests that European defense industry is becoming more, um, more of a robust compet competitor. Now, uh, maintaining the centrality of the transatlantic relationship for us, Portugal, is very, very important. To you. All you need to do is look at a map to see where we are. We are at the westernmost point of Europe. We are on the Atlantic. We have a maritime heritage. Uh, the Atlantic is, is, uh, has been um, the source of meaning for us in the world. Um, and it's from, through the, from the Atlantic that we've then reached other seas historically. So uh, for us, it is very important to work uh, towards uh, avoiding rifts, difficulties in the transatlantic relationship. We are very much a country um, that sees itself as you know, perfectly in the center of European integration, um, but at the same time concerned that there should be no contradiction between European integration and uh, the transatlantic relationship. And sometimes when these two have come under uh, tension, then, uh, then we, we see it as our role, we're not alone fortunately, uh, is to ensure that there is no uh, contradiction, that there is a harmonization uh, between, between the two. Um, this brings me to the second, uh, second major challenge, apart from maintaining the transatlantic relationship, which is uh, in a context in which the European Union is developing a defense and security identity, the European Union is moving towards uh, a defense union, uh, how 
can we avoid this clashing with, with NATO? What is the meaning, for example, of when European officials, such as Federica Mogherini and others, talk about uh, the need for Europe to develop strategic autonomy? This term, strategic autonomy, sets off alarm bells in, in, in some quarters, um, namely those who are very much focused on, on NATO and, and NATO alone. Um, I think that uh, this is, at the end of the day, a development that is, should be seen uh, without drama, that should be seen as normal. My, uh, my, my quick um, uh, way of explaining the way that I see this is that we, 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 should, we have to be clear about our prepositions. When we talk about strategic autonomy, it is not so much about strategic autonomy from if you ask about what, if you ask the question of strategic autonomy from, then immediately it's ah, you want to do things without involving NATO, shutting out NATO, avoiding going around NATO. Much more important is to be talking about for. What's it for? The European Union and NATO have different vocations in many, many, many ways, have different capacity to intervene uh, internationally, and uh, when one talks about strategic autonomy for then one should be thinking about developing capacities that can play to the strengths of each of the different institutions. Um, because NATO is simply not adequate for some missions which the European Union could undertake, and vice versa. So I prefer to think of strategic autonomy for rather than strategic autonomy from. And if one does, one focuses in that manner, I think that one can avoid. Um, uh, some of the uh, traps that have appeared in discussing this, this term. Another major challenge that NATO faces going forward over the next decade or two is technological leadership. Uh, this has very much been, uh, NATO, NATO has been very much uh, at the forefront of technological leadership. Of course, we're talking largely about the United States, um, but, uh, but not only. And I think that the, a major strategic challenge that we will have is to maintain not only our uh, capacities at adequate level for the kind of missions and operations that we might wish to undertake, but also doing the abstract uh, research that you're not quite sure where it's going to lead to, but produces the capacity to innovate uh, constantly. We know that other, uh, others around the world, and I'm here thinking uh, obviously of China, not that China is in any, may, any way the focus of NATO, but China is developing very rapidly. And I'm sitting here in New Delhi, and I know all of you are very conscious of this. And I think that it is significant that uh, it is significant when we talk about the need to maintain technological leadership, because we're talking about the situation in which we might find ourselves in. 20 or 40 or 60 years down the, down the road. And that, that future, which seems remote, the future is being made now. This is, these are the, what we do now, or this year, next year, and so on, is, is what will largely condition where we will be in a couple of decades down the road. Um, for um, NATO, another major challenge now uh, is, and Afghanistan is, is, is here very close by, uh, is the question of how to leave uh, when one has been involved, for example, in Afghanistan, but it's not the only case. Um, we might be facing that in Iraq. There is an American desire to move from Syria, which is not a NATO operation, but, but uh, the US is very present. And it's uh, que the question of uh, at which point uh, how can you decide that it is sufficiently situation is sufficiently mature and it makes sense to be leaving. Obviously, none of us want to be in Afghanistan for the rest of our lives. Um, at the same time, there is a clear understanding that if we were to pull out tomorrow, uh, very quickly conflict would return to, or immediately conflict would return to Afghanistan, conflict, chaos, disorder. And so how is it um, how, what are the appropriate mechanisms for uh, putting a, an end to, the, to NATO's 
long-standing mission. I think 2003 was when the NATO uh, NATO began to to operate in Afghanistan. When it's the appropriate, when and how to leave, and this is uh, also valid for other parts of the world, in particular Iraq. Um, With respect to the European Union, uh, we are now at a moment when there has been an engagement by uh, all of the member states of the European Union to undertake a uh, significant joint investment in, in defense. I should be clear about this in saying that armed forces will remain under the command of uh, national uh, governments. I do not give any credence to ideas of a European army or other similar uh, expressions. However, there will be, and it is uh, consensual, um, much greater harmonization of our capabilities and uh, much greater integration of our defense industries and mechanisms for procurement and so on. The, um, as I've mentioned, the forthcoming financial, multi-annual financial framework will be putting forward about uh, 14 billion uh, dollars, uh, 14 billion euros in, um, into uh, a defense, European defense fund for the first time, which will be allowing um, European countries to supplement their own national investments in order to, in order to invest in capabilities that are of general interest. It will allow uh, countries to work together in, in groups on projects, so-called uh, PESCO projects, the Permanent Structured Cooperation projects, um, which will develop new capabilities that are, that are of interest for several, uh, several of our military uh, forces, several of our armed forces. Um, we uh, foresee that over the next uh, three, four years, we're going to be making serious progress towards the defense union, whereby our Article 42.7, um, I wouldn't say becomes uh, an equivalent and much less an alternative to the Article, fifth, the fifth, uh, Article 5 of NATO. Article 5 of NATO is the one that says an attack upon one is an attack upon all. Um, Article 42.7 of the Euro Treaty of Lisbon, the European <coughs> Union Treaty says that uh, it, uh, it is, each member state has a duty to support others. It's a lighter version. And of course, we don't have the same dedication of capabilities uh, that we have under the NATO framework. But I would say that Article 42.7 will gain, uh, will gain some, some, some uh, complexity, some depth, some substance over the next uh, few years. And uh, so we have a very rapidly evolving landscape. I would say that in the last two years, what has happened at the European Union level is unprecedented. It has, um, it's much deeper than what happened in the 60 years before that. Over the next three, four years, we're going to see a continuation of this acceleration, intensification of defense cooperation. And uh, the trick for us is to be able to do that in a manner that does not conflict with NATO uh, for, the, for the reasons that I mentioned in uh, previous comments. Um, hanging over us at the moment, of course, is the spectra of Brexit. Having uh, followed, as you all have, uh, the uh, uh, events of the last weeks, months, I will not offer any predictions. I think it would be very foolhardy but um, uh, I think I'm sure there is absolutely no one in this world that uh, back uh, three years ago was capable of saying what might, uh, what might unfold uh, the way that it has unfolded. And, uh, and that even goes so far as to now have a question mark about whether Brexit will actually happen. But working on the assumption that it happens, what impact does that have in terms of European uh, security and defense? Well, I would say uh, two or three things about that. The first is that in a, an immediate sense of the European Defense Union 
burgeoning or nascent European Defense Union. Um, it doesn't impact on the structures because, because we are talking about something that is nascent. In other words, the UK will be leaving something that is only starting. Uh, however, obviously the UK is a major uh, European defense player and there is a consensus uh, absolutely con around the table. I had dinner on Friday night with the French defense minister, for example, and uh, around the table there is a consensus that we want the UK to, be, to have a very close relationship with the European Union. How? It's really very, very difficult to tell because uh, we need to sort out what kind of relationship with the EU, EU and UK will have overall before we can uh, say what it's going to be like in the field of defense. Um, obviously, uh, even though it's consensual on our side and on the British side, that we want to have this strong relationship, we need to have more than a simple consensus. We need to have some kind of structures. At the end of the day, we do need structures, to institutional structures of some sort, uh, to underpin a relationship. It can't, it can't simply be on the basis of, you know, we're here for you and you're here for us and so on. And it has to be something um, that, uh, that is institutionalized. And we're quite far from having identified the manner in which this can happen. From the point of view of Portugal, uh, UK is an Atlantic uh, country. It's very much one of the maritime powers. And uh, as we have an Atlantic focus, we're very keen that the UK's traditional Atlantic uh, presence and the projection of, an, of a notion of the European Union as also being not only continental, but Atlantic, um, we're keen that that should uh, somehow be maintained and fed in to European Union decision making, um, but we don't have any f uh, idea yet about how exactly how that might materialize. Uh, we know that we will certainly start very soon to be doing this informally, but we also know that we will have to have formal structures. So anything I say about Brexit is open to correction by reality. Reality will certainly prove to be richer than my, imagina my imagination. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but it's obviously something that we have to exercise our imagination on because it is, is of central importance for the future of European uh, security and defense. So I'll stop there and um, be very happy to comment on any issues that you want to raise. Great, sir. That was, I think, a very rich uh, presentation. <laughs> and uh, before I invite my wiser colleagues to jump in and pose questions to you. I have, uh, I have one question, but with two parts. I think that's uh, the chair's prerogative, one question, but let me give you two parts. The first is, um, even as you talk about the nascent and growing defense union, I think the political and the economic union are struggling in, in EU. So how do you reconcile the ambition of having a defense union, even as democracy, demography, and the dragon uh, are beginning to chip away on the political and economic union, the 17 plus one, for example. Um, uh, also, uh, the fact that uh, a democracy is throwing up crazy outcomes, nationalist leaders who are not necessarily invested in the collective that we want Europe to be. And of course, the left out uh, uh, demography, the Yellow West and others elsewhere, and how committed will they be to invest in this project of the defense union? So that's one part. The second part, of course, is, um, you mentioned your Atlantic leaning, but you also have an Indo-Pacific uh, past a few hundred years ago. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, as the EU begins to serve its security interest within its original continent, it is beginning to realize that the front line happens to be the Indo-Pacific, and the EU wants to be here as well. Mm -hmm. And has that gained any traction? Mm -hmm. Or is it just big speeches and big pulpits in, in the Munich Security Conference or in other forums? that uh, they have expressed a desire. Is there any significant uh, uh, change in posture, change in capacity, change in establishments that are beginning to ensure EU becomes a significant actor in the indo pacific OK. Great. Thank you, Samir. OK. Um, on the European Union uh, and uh, political and uh, economic challenges, e economic uh, I think that, to be honest, we're doing as fine as anybody else. Uh, obviously, there are much higher growth rates here and in China, 
Um, but looking around the world, we're we're fairly solid. There is a there is a slowdown. There's a slowdown around the world. The Chinese uh, uh, U.S. Uh, trade tensions and so on could, will have an impact. But uh, by and large, European economies are have certainly recovered from 2008, and our um, institutional capacity to ensure that, for example, the euro should not come under the same kind of pressure as it did then. Uh, is has been seriously uh, consolidated since then. On the political front, you're absolutely uh, right to point out that there are major challenges around the world to democracies. And uh, there is, at the moment, um, the need for us, and I think we've, we're doing our part in Portugal, uh, because it's a rather exceptional case in which we simply do not have a populist or populist by populist I mean a simple irresponsible anti everything uh, party um, and I think that one of the reasons why uh, we've managed so far this is complex and there are many reasons so uh, I would be I will be a little bit reductionist here admittedly but say that there is an important factor which is that Portuguese political um, system has been capable of generating real alternatives. One of the major points of criticism that has led to the development of populist parties is, you know, you elect one or you elect the other and you get the same. You get the same results, you get the same policies because it's all dictated by Brussels and they have no leeway. And so what's the point? You might as well um, choose, choose, choose the populists. And in the Portuguese political system, it has been possible, uh, particularly with this government, of which I happen to be a member, but I'm, I, I'm trying to be to abstract from that quality. Uh, it has been possible to say, you know, we can do something really quite different from what Brussels was expecting us to do, to do so in a manner that is perfectly compatible with our European uh, obligations. And, and um, and to show the population that uh, that there is a very significant uh, ideologically, politically, and uh, in terms of uh, the social consequences um, difference. And I think that uh, this example is being seen as interesting by other countries that are also looking for ways of uh, of, of having this kind of uh, difference inside the political system. On the other hand. Um, you know, we have to recognize that the challenges faced by the European Union are challenges that are also a product of reactions to globalization uh, around, around the world. The European Union happens to be, because it's economically advanced, because it's economically very open, it's very exposed to globalization, and therefore, uh, you know, the, the consequences are great. But I would venture to say that in any country in the world, there is a democracy. Of course, it's much easier if you're not a democracy. That's, that's not an option I would like to recommend. Um, so in, in, in India, for example, the uh, possibilities of opening up, breaking down barriers that exist to international trade are um, possibilities that would be uh, looked upon with, with, with enormous concern by certain sectors of the population that would be directly affected, that would have nowhere else to go, that would be the so-called, uh, it's a bit disdainful, I don't like the idea, but the so-called losers of globalization, people with lower levels of education, people who have um, less capacity to reinvent themselves. And so I think that uh, we have to look at the development of populist forces in the context of the way international history has developed in the past uh, few decades. Demography, you're absolutely right to, to point out as being a challenge that we have. And we have a, a double problem here, because the, what we need is more people. And since our European populations are, are, are forgetting the ancient trick of how to reproduce in greater numbers, the, uh, the truth is we have, to, we have to have immigrants. We have to bring in people from other parts of the world. And at the same time, this is precisely a factor that has been latched onto by populists to say, you know, the, our country is being flooded with, uh, with immigrants. Again, I'm very proud to be a member of government of a country that, uh, that does not have this kind of uh, concern and where we have uh, 
people, mostly from Portuguese-speaking countries, but, uh, but not only, also Ukrainians and so on, who have come into Portugal, have made their home there, and we're very happy that they're there. So this, this double challenge of the demography coupled with, uh, coupled with demagoguery, demagoguery that is anti-immigration uh, is uh, something that we have to know how to uh, get a grip with. And ultimately, uh, I think that the demagoguery, if, if, it, if it calms down for a year or two, people will begin to forget and to, to be more available. And I think that the anti-immigrant uh, discourse is, is, a, is a, something that is a fruit of this moment, but uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be the case in, in a few years' time. There might be other uh, themes that are more appealing to, to, to the populist discourse. And that's, I hope, the moment when we can seriously take a look at increasing our, um, our population or our younger population and being able to not be in the situation, for example, of Japan. I was looking recently at a report about Japan's aging population, which is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's dramatic uh, the way that the country is growing older and the population is growing uh, smaller. We're not quite at that stage, but we also have major challenges. And immigration, as far as I can see, is the only uh, solution. Yes, we can extend the working age until I don't know when, to 68 or 70 or 75, uh, but, uh, but that's, these are, these are uh, small remedies. So Europe has all of these challenges, um, and it has the dragon challenge, as we all do, but uh, the, the, the dragon for us uh, is a, it's not a, uh, China is not an ally, but it's not uh, an enemy either. It is a country um, that has a different strategic worldview, and we must uh, pay attention that the Chinese strategic worldview uh, should not, uh, should not uh, develop at the expense of our own uh, security. But uh, at the same time, China is a country that we want to work with. We have, uh, we have significant uh, Chinese investments that we're very happy to have. And uh, we're happy to develop uh, closer infrastructure links with China and so on. But of course, we know that we have to be thinking about the, the long term. The long term need not be one of confrontation, but certainly we would not want it to be one of subjection either. Um, in this context, uh, I think that perhaps it is even because of this context that we're finding um, now the, 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 the ballast to be present for us to be really moving forward in security and defense. This has happened uh, in, the, in the context of, uh, of these challenges such as Brexit because of the recognition that if we don't pull together at this moment and it, Pulling together, uh, being a significant actor on the international front, requires us to have a, uh, a military identity, which we did not have in the past. Um, then, then I think that uh, I think that there, this, is, this is a decisive moment. Interestingly, um, defense and security is not a major problem from the point of view of public opinion. There are many other European issues which are problematic and don't go down well in this or that country. Defense and security has not been the object of major uh, opposition anywhere. On the Indo-Pacific? On the Indo-Pacific, yes. I think I agree with you. Uh, I think that uh, I'll, that does not mean that we're now all of a sudden going to be projecting uh, European frigates to be patrolling the, uh, the Indo-Pacific or uh, any, any such thing. What it does mean is that uh, we have to, as we think about scenarios for the future, we have to have an availability to uh, think about the possibility of having to project forces for one reason or another. Um, please, I don't know, don't know if there are journalists present, but I'm not saying, port, don't, don't quote me as a Portuguese and defense and minister. And and not at all, but if you, if you um, think about in 20 years, 40 years, the possibility of conflict here or there in, um, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, scenarios. This may be a situation in which for the purpose of uh, stability, purpose of peacekeeping, etc., we may find that there is a need to, to, to be present. We have NATO present in Afghanistan. Uh, that's uh, clearly a, a factor. 
We have um, uh, other possibilities that you can imagine, and certainly over the next decades, these are probable uh, scenarios where, where you can have European Union um, crimes. However, I would say that there is no appetite whatsoever for doing this outside of the remit of uh, United Nations Security Council uh, mandate. So um, we need to be able to operate with major uh, armed forces from different parts of the world, including the Indian, including Japanese, Koreans, etc. cetera. Um, if there is a need for a major peacekeeping operation on the, God forbid, on the Korean Peninsula, for example. Um, so yes, Indo-Pacific is, I would say, uh, where the global game is at. And uh, the European Union uh, does not see itself as, uh, in any way, as being a colonial power or any such thing. But uh, it needs to be able to contribute to global stability. And that means having a presence in the Indo-Pacific. Scenerization. Dita, you want to come in? Uh, Nanda, do you want to come in after this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, question regarding the, the defense union. Um, with the UK leaving, uh, it's widely expected that, that the largest economies in Europe, that is Germany and France, will have to you know, carry the brunt of, of the expenses for, for that. And uh, as you know, um, in Germany, the best way to lose an election is to say that you want to raise the <laughs> cost <Okay>. of <laughs> defense. <laughs> uh, at the same time, uh, Germany and France, unfortunately, uh, come when it comes to defense from very different angles and have not been uh, uh, very smoothly cooperating on that. So my question to you is, from a you know, Portuguese point of view, um, uh, who are the forces within Europe from other countries who actually could uh, uh, push for this and, and, and carry it through or, or, or push the main economies to, to uh, put in more of an effort that uh, they are probably uh, willing then? No. Okay, can I take one more? Yes. Uh, Nandan. Uh, well, mine is somewhat a continuation. A continuation of uh, what Samir said. Uh, you made this distinction that uh, there won't be a European army, the armed forces will be under national governments. And you also spoke about EU wanting to be present in the Indo Pacific. So suppose uh, India wants to have some kind of security arrangement with the EU. Does it negotiate with the EU, which has no armed forces, or does it negotiate with individual national governments? I mean, the strategic partnership that was signed on the naval front was with France. Yeah, for that. For that example. Is the practice today. Correct. Will that change? Will that change? Okay. Um, now, I. I I would say that uh, France and Germany are evidently uh, very much major players. Uh, and you're, you're right. Uh, they have uh, different approaches. And uh, I would say in a very sketchy manner that uh, the German approach, ap apart from Germany's uh, heritage, the way that the um, public opinion looks upon uh, investment in defense, apart from those issues which are clearly dis distinct in Germany and France. But one of the major differences is that uh, Germany has systematically proposed going forward all of us together, uh, whereas France has been saying we should go forward amongst, uh, with a smaller group of those who are willing to go fastest and, uh, and, and not worry about two or three or four speed uh, Europe in this because that is what will give us uh, the capability to act internationally. If we all go together, we'll go at the pace of the smallest. And there's no right or wrong answer uh, to this. Um, I think that uh, the way things are shaping up at the moment is a mixture of both, whereby you have uh, for uh, overall institutional purposes the German approach, where we're all going together uh, fairly slowly, but at the same time, you're seeing the development of uh, forums such as the uh, uh, the European Intervention in, uh, Initiative (EII), which uh, has been largely promoted by the French, which brings together ten countries, not all of whom, by the way, are European Union members. Uh, they've got uh, uh, well, the future we will have the the uh, UK 
uh, out, presumably, <laughs> but um, also possible, possibly Norway joining the European Intervention Initiative. And you have Denmark, which is a country that has an opt-out from the European Defense Corporation. And then you have a couple of countries, Finland and um, well, Sweden wanting to join. Uh, that is, they're not, they're not members of, of NATO. And then you have six or seven others. We're a total of nine, uh, including Portugal and, uh, and, and Spain and, and of course, uh, France and Germany, which are in NATO in, uh, in the European Union. And what are these countries doing together? They, the European Intervention Initiative is basically a mechanism for promoting uh, a deepening of a, a joint military culture. In other words, promoting the, cap the capability of uh, these countries to, at fairly short notice, develop a joint mission uh, somewhere. Uh, there is, uh, it's, it's a very loose uh, structure from the, point of, from the formal point of view, so it does not have to be approved by all or a certain number or whatever. Any three can get together and do something together if they feel the requirements. And these can be military missions, civilian missions of a mil requiring military assets, for example. Um, one, one of the scenarios that is being used as an example is the Hurricane Irma, I think it's called, that hit the Caribbean and uh, that uh, required the evacuation of large uh, populations and so on. And you had French, Dutch, British, all there, each doing their own thing in an uncoordinated manner. Hopefully, with the European Intervention Initiative, you would have a single structure of coordination, so it would make um, for much greater synergies and capacity. So I see European defense cooperation moving, to, moving forward, as, as we always do, uh, traditionally do in the European Union, in a fuzzy manner, in a manner which is um, uh, not going to satisfy all. Uh, in fact, it's not, not, going, not going to satisfy any. Um, because everybody who have a different has a different ideal scenario, but but it does allow us to move forward, and it will be partly altogether and partly with some um, some some groupings moving faster. Portugal is always keen to be in the grouping that is moving at the at the forefront. Um, there is no substitute for for Germany and France. Uh, we need them to be engaged in the in the European uh, in defense issues. But there are a number of other countries that are heavily involved. Uh, I'm thinking of the, the, the Netherlands, um, uh, Belgium, countries that are uh, much smaller dimension, uh, Spain. Uh, Italy is at the moment uh, going under a parenthesis, but uh, I think that it will be back. Um, and, uh, and I see that these countries are, are you know, they're, they're being very supportive of the central axis, which is uh, France and Germany. The, the question of, it's not an either or question, uh, I, I would say. Um, certainly, uh, India can, should maintain its defense ties with individual European countries. And from the point of view of specific military uh, capability, specific military cooperation, uh, for the foreseeable future, individual countries are, are the, the most appropriate <coughs> partner. Um, however, what, we've, what we're finding now is that because of the cooperation, level of cooperation that, it, that exists and is growing at the level of the European Union, then it will make sense, I think, for India to be, in the context of the strategic partnership, developing a security and defense dimension, which at the moment uh, does not have the basis to go beyond uh, discussions, but these discussions should be taking place. I'm a little bit out of the loop. I don't know whether they have been taking place, but for example, with our uh, EU military staff, which is uh, growing, our structures are uh, changing, and, uh, and I think in the next 12 months or so, you'll see some quite significant structures. But already, we, do have, we don't have an army, but we have um, people in uniform. I was going to say men, but that would be incorrect. It's not. We have men and women in, in uniform. Uh, in terms of planning, developing planning capabilities, develop the command and control uh, side is embryonic at the moment, but, but the embryo is there. So uh, it's, it's happening. And so uh, there is uh, something with which India 
can can work which uh, I, I, would, uh, I would say is going to grow over the next few years. So that's not an alternative, but it can be an addition. And then, then you want to, so yeah, I think. No, completely different yeah. um, You remember you Russia? <laughs> yes. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned that Russia is one of the challenges that uh, NATO and EU faces. But at the same time, I see in Europe today, there is a certain amount of sanctions fatigue and uh, there are some countries which are put pulling in different directions maybe. I mean, uh, to me, the example of that is the fact that uh, you were not able to come to a single understanding on how to deal with, uh, let's say, gas supplies to Europe and how to deal with gas from building the pipeline to Germany. Uh, Germany stood its ground and said that the pipeline will go ahead. So if there is this mood in Europe at this moment. One question would be, how do you envisage, sitting in Portugal, how do you envisage the resolution of this problem? Or what is the path forward that you see? The second is a much broader issue, is that if uh, China is the rising challenge in many ways, whether it's economically, ideologically, and everyone wants to socialize China, do you envisage the possibility of socializing China without Russia? OK, thanks. Um, firstly, Russia is not going to go away. Uh, it's our neighbor. We live next to it. We're not going away either. So we are uh, going to, as in the past, uh, have to develop uh, some modus vivendi, which is more healthy than the one we have at the moment with, with Russia. Um, we have a, I, and I, I think this is likely to be happening, partly because of because Russia needs it. Um, we, for us, it's of course very desirable. But linking up to your other question about China, Russia has a major problem. Russia uh, is headed fast in the direction of being a Chinese vassal. Um, and these things take decades. But uh, the, the way that uh, Russia has adapted itself to uh, international sanctions is problematic and gives a layer of vulnerability to Russia that I think uh, Russia, and I, I believe that the wiser Russians recognize this, Russia can uh, only uh, avoid by returning to some form of relationship, a healthy relationship with Europe. At the same time, we have a big problem because when Russia invaded Crimea, basically broke every rule in the book. Uh, it, uh, and this is something that we cannot simply say, well, OK, we'll, we will forget about that. You can have Crimea. So how to go beyond Crimea is, uh, is, is something that we don't have any solution for right now. Ultimately, though, uh, independently of Crimea, I think both European Union and Russia have a uh, great interest in finding some form of being together that does not, um, that is not so uh, confrontational, that is not based on, as, which is Russia's approach at the moment, undermining um, either its immediate neighborhood through the hybrid sort of warfare, uh, which is, you know, well, it's not plausible deniability, it's, it's very implausible deniability. Um, or uh, the way that it has also been active in terms of promoting uh, disinformation in uh, elections uh, in, in Europe, not to mention the United States. This has been systematic Europe. It's very quite, I think, significantly well documented that Russia has been supported exporting extreme right-wing parties in various European countries. Um, so, th but this is this is this is an unhealthy relationship. We need to go beyond it. We need to go beyond it for the sake of Europe. I think Russia needs to go beyond it. the The question of China, I I, I don't think uh, socialization is uh, a realistic uh, objective. It's something that I say to sometimes to to some colleagues, some European countries, or even in my own, say, look. Uh, the rest of the world is different from us, but that's, that's, that's what being 
part of an international system is about. It's about interacting with countries, cultures, mentalities, attitudes that are different from our own. And we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to do that without thinking, if I talk to you a bit more, maybe you'll become more like me. It's not going to happen. And the Chinese are certainly, with their uh, very strongly, deeply rooted cultural uh, traditions, not going to uh, be socialized into being like Europeans. However, the Chinese, I think, um, have uh, uh, they're not against the multilateral order, like any country, they would like it to be a bit more like this or a bit more like that. And because they're a powerful country, they have some capacity to influence, to mold. Um, but we see them as essentially operating within uh, an order uh, that, that, that we can also relate to. Uh, I hope uh, that one of the challenges that we have to, to maintain is that uh, that this should continue. As over the decades, the international order will naturally undergo some mutations. The important thing is that these mutations should be mutations that we are comfortable with, and also necessarily ones that China has to live with. So uh, although there are aspects that the Chinese are likely to contest, um, unlike Russia, we don't see them systematically contesting international order. And I think that's a very good basis for us to be uh, to be working a relation, working out a relationship. Uh, let me uh, invite. Uh, I think there are four hands that I can see. Uh, let me first invite uh, Ambassador Vishwanathan and um, uh, Abhijit. Let's take two questions at a time, and then we'll go to the, the next two after that. Ambassador. Uh, thank you, Samir. Uh, Excellency, it's great to see you back again in ORF. We remember the many sessions we have had here. I have two questions. One is, Excellency, could you so show, could you throw some light on how the United States looks as uh, the European Defense Union? Do, do they look at this uh, with suspicion? Particularly because uh, they can argue that uh, the European countries are not contributing enough to the NATO, and at the same time they are investing in a new defense union. Is that the feeling? And the second question is, as two institutions, over a period of time, there are bound to be friction between NATO and the European Defense Union. So how is uh, EU going to tackle this? Particularly because if uh, Brexit happens, then UK will be out of the EU and naturally out of the European Defense Union, but it will still be a member of the NATO. So what will be the dynamics in such a situation? Mm. And you already have Turkey as a NATO member, but not part of the So I'm just like, complicating it a little. Abhijit. Thank you, sir. I had a question on uh, e EU maritime policy and maritime strategy. In 2014, the European Union came up with a maritime strategy that was surprisingly not very forward-leaning on Indo-Pacific security. It did talk of the Indo-Pacific, but it essentially was a strategy for the rim regions of Europe you know, the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the Baltics, the North Sea, all of that. And um, in some of the discussions that we had with, with our European friends, the impression that we got was that Europe on three counts was not very willing to, uh, to go uh, further into the Indo-Pacific. And one of them was the fact that uh, they hadn't made up their mind on China. Uh, a lot of countries in the region wanted them to take a stand on what the Chinese were doing in the South China Sea, their, you know, assertive policies in the Indian Ocean. Uh, Europe was on the fence on that. Second, and importantly, as you mentioned, was Russia. The Russia was taking in a great deal of European attention and energy. But the third and most important reason that we were told was investments. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Europe, at that point, didn't quite have the capacity to be a really relevant force across the Indo-Pacific. My question to you would be, sir, that have any of those fundamentals changed in the sense that we know that now on China, Europe is a little more skeptical than it was earlier. But it continues to be involved with, the, with Russia. The equation really hasn't changed. And if, I, uh, if my information is correct, that a lot of programs, European programs that are active in the Indian Ocean, basically pertain only to the Western Indian Ocean. The EU CAP, Nesta, the Krimario program, et cetera, they don't go far beyond into, into South Asia. Can we, ha can, we ha can we expect now a new EU policy that will be more active in South Asia, in, in the southern Indian Ocean and across the Bay of Bengal, perhaps, can we expect to build some capacity along with European 
uh, European states in this very critical region. Okay, great. Uh, two interesting, challenging uh, sets of questions, Ambassador Vishwanathan. Um, on the relationship with the United States, it, it's it's not possible, I don't think, to say what the U.S. thinks because the U.S. I don't want to say it doesn't know what it thinks, but there are many, <laughs> many U.S. Many know, US's. The US doesn't think. <laughs> there are many U.S.s. I was at the Munich Security Conference. Um, Vice President Pence was there, and uh, then Joe Biden was there. Many different speeches. What they had to say had nothing to do with each, each other. other. So. Um, Obviously, Vice President Pence is, is uh, Vice President of the current administration. But uh, at the same time, you know, uh, American strategic thinking uh, cannot change uh, according to whoever happens to occupy the White House from one moment to another. There is a certain depth, uh, a certain amount of um, uh, strategic thinking that, uh, that, that is long term, takes a long time to, to evolve. We are in the curious uh, circumstance whereby, because of the evolution of American strategic thinking, we're saying, hey, don't forget Europe exists, because there has been uh, this uh, shifting of attention, longer term shifting of attention to, to the Indo-Pacific. Um, but, uh, uh, but then also, and having the Americans then uh, say, OK, but you guys, you need to pay more. And then when we do, they're saying, hang on, what is this business about developing independent capabilities? You know, who said that, uh, who said that, that we were OK with that? <laughs> this, is, this, this is something that we are working through. Uh, and to be honest, I think we're a little bit better off than we were six or 12 months ago. I think that there has been some evolution, accommodation, mechanisms of confidence building. Confidence building sounds like we're enemies and we're shooting each other or something. But you know, in a time of evolving structures, you do need to have uh, confidence that the other part is not doing something that is against some fundamental interest. In the European uh, perspective, we are uh, taking into account that American uh, fundamental, uh, the fundamental aspects of American strategic thinking are going to be focusing more on the Indo-Pacific, we're taking that into account. We're developing our own capabilities. And inevitably, that means developing a certain amount of, uh, of uh, autonomous capacity. Um, we, we're very keen on the expression single set of forces. In other words, because we have uh, national control over uh, our assets, um, and we only have one set of, of forces, set of assets, uh, this is the same one that we're going to be employing for the purposes of NATO, for the purposes of the European, uh, European Union. So um, that means that we have to have a high degree, uh, which is only just developing, of joint planning. Our planning cycles were, in fact, out of sync. And now they're coming into sync between the European Union and, uh, and NATO. And uh, I think the, the fact that the two institutions happen to be located in Brussels is, is makes, facilitates uh, enormously. But I, I, I don't think that uh, the, uh, it's possible to say that we are not investing in NATO by increasing our capabilities. These are capabilities that will be, they are deployable for NATO. They will be deployed for NATO. Uh, but we have to see what kind of missions emerge, hopefully post. Afghanistan. On, on, on Brexit, um, yes, uh, you are right. The EU, Brexit will mean the UK, major uh, defense power in Europe, will be leaving the European Union, but not NATO. But uh, there, there, I think that um, the applicable points are the ones that I tried to mention earlier about the need to find the appropriate institutional structure that will keep the UK as, not as a member of the EU and not as a member of the European Defense Union, but as a, a voice that is present and taken into account um, and worked with on the, by the European Union. The, the British are, are keen, to, re, keen to, to repeat that they're leaving the European Union, but they're not leaving Europe. And, and we agree with that. Uh, as, as Europe, uh, you know, we, we want very much to be working with the, 
with the Brits. We don't exactly know how yet, but you know, over the next months and year or so, as as Brexit becomes clearer, uh, then then we will have to find our way. On the maritime strategy, you know, have the fundamentals changed? Um, I would say. Uh, you're talking about a 2014 strategy. We're five years down the road. I would say that if you try to project, and it's speculative, it's worth what it's worth, but projecting a couple of decades down the road, I would say, yes, fundamentals. There are some changes in fundamentals. Uh, level of capacity, certainly. Uh, the level of the relationship with China and Russia, perhaps. Uh, but they're not the only players. Um, in 2014 and today, for the most part. Our uh, maritime um, reach uh, does not go beyond the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, it is, you're quite right, it's not, it's the Western Indian Ocean, it's uh, Operation Atalanta, which gave us the basis for Cremario, for, for um, uh, the uh, uh, EU Nesto and so on. Um, and we see that as being uh, an important contribution to European security because of the amount of European trade backwards and forwards that goes through the shipping lanes uh, of, through the Suez Canal and through the Indian Ocean. They, goes, they go further out, of course, uh, to, uh, to, through the Indonesian archipelago and to China and so on. For the moment, I wouldn't see any prospect in the immediate future, but I think it is natural uh, and the next time we develop a maritime strategy to find a more ambitious uh, approach. I'm not fortunately involved with that. I don't know if, don't even know if a new maritime strategy is being developed, but it's surely one will be uh, written up in the next few years and I, I would expect it to be more ambitious and to be looking, for example, at how to interact with the Indian Navy, how to, which is a, a major player uh, in the in the maritime world, in the part of, a wor part of the world that will become of increasing interest for us. Uh, I need a final two questions. We'll go to uh, uh, Arka and then Aprajit. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, my question is, uh, uh, why don't you come here and ask? Hello. Uh, Okay, uh, am I audible? I can speak out loud. Come here and ask. <laughs> Minister, my question is regarding the future of uh, INF Treaty. Uh, it is currently uh, under its notice period. So how likely do you see that uh, collapsing? And. Uh, what is the view of NATO in terms of the future of deployment of intermediate range missiles in Europe? And how is that contributing to friction between uh, uh, America and, and European countries? And the final question, Abraj. Um, Portugal is one of the European countries that's most at risk for the effects of climate change and their significant security implications to that. In the Ministry of Defense's planning for the future, is that taken into account and to what degree? And is that coordinated with the European Union? OK, thank you. On the INF, I can't, tell, I can't say that I'm optimistic. I'm not optimistic at all. Uh, the current notice period, in all probability, will expire, and the INF treaty will cease to exist. Um, you know, in NATO, to be honest, we put the blame for that fairly and squarely in the, on the side of Russia. Russia has systematically, over a number of years, um, pushed beyond the bounds of what is acceptable. And now, leaving this immediate blame game, um, the truth is that the world for which the INF Treaty was developed is a world that, 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 that has evolved. It no longer exists. Um, and the world of the, of the 1980s is, uh, has been deeply transformed. And that 
leads me to believe that we have to be thinking of mechanisms that will allow for a wider uh, multilateral regime that um, puts, has control mechanisms for, um, for intermediate uh, nuclear arms. Uh, this is not going to happen immediately. But I think the, the circumstances of the uh, disappearance of the INF Treaty will uh, lead for a search for, for new approaches. The, um, I wouldn't say, I don't expect there to be a repetition of the circumstances that led to the INF Treaty, namely, namely an arms race in Europe. But there is uh, undoubtedly around the world a, a, an increase of defense expenditure. And uh, we are very much favorable, we as Portugal and as a member of the European Union and also as NATO, we're very much in favor of the development of regimes, of international regimes that give predictability and uh, verifiability to, um, and de therefore bring down tensions and reduce the probability of usage of uh, such weapons. This is going to be a di diplomatic task for, for a generation, I think, for the uh, next 20 years. On, on climate change, uh, the straightforward answer uh, to your question is to what, de to what degree, uh, well, it's just over there, to what degree uh, it's present in the Ministry of Defense uh, planning. It, it's not present in the Ministry of Defense planning, except in some, uh, some, some generic strategic documents which make a reference to it as a source of, of insecurity. Um, the reason is that the type of insecurity that it produces is very much, it's, it's human insecurity. Uh, it's not a military uh, challenge. And, and uh, although it will probably lead to greater levels of military deployment, for example, in disaster situations, but it's, uh, it's something that is not clearly present in our military planning. It is in our Ministry of Defense planning. But it is something that, uh, that we are taking into account as we work, from, for example, on forest fires, on desertification, on water supplies at a, at a national level. There, it's more the lead of other, other ministries. Good. Any other question? Because I think uh, we have time limits left. Uh, I promised 5 p.m. to the colleagues if there's one last question they don't want to bring in. Otherwise, I'm going to ask a question and then we wrap it up. If someone else wants to step in, listen to that. Otherwise, hold your peace. Okay. Good. So, another one, final question to you. Uh, you were in Delhi uh, for uh, four years, I think, in your previous Aftar as an ambassador. You're coming back, uh, you're visiting India again. Uh, how do you see India's engagement with EU evolve? So mm -hmm. you have served as, served as the ambassador of EU to India, and now you're coming back as a, one of the European defense ministers engaging with the Indian uh, South Bloc. Has India's appreciation of EU changed? Mm -hmm. I think you, you would agree that a decade ago, the EU was a non-existent actor in the Indian strategic conversation. How has that progressed in your two different avatars uh, in your, your engagement with New Delhi? Yes, uh, thank you for that. I, I would say that um, uh, since I left, things have improved considerably. I, I, I hope there's no relationship between the two. <laughs> um, they, they have uh, improved considerably because I see that this current government, uh, I mean, you know, these things are dependent on many factors. And the truth is, without uh, wishing to be in any manner rude, because all of our countries, democracies, that is, have periods in which governments are more dynamic and other periods in which they're less dynamic. And the last few years before the current government was at the end of a long cycle in which it was very difficult to do anything new uh, on, in, in many areas. And the introduction of a new government, again, this is no comment on, on the, the specific nature, except to say that, uh, that there, is a, there was a new energy that came in in 2014. And uh, this new energy included an availability to think about the European Union in a manner that had not been part of Indian thinking in, in the past. At the same time, uh, at the EU level, there was also 
uh, period in which we, after about 2014, we were also, uh, but before then we'd been very much focused on the economic crisis and had very great difficulty. After that, partly as a result of Crimea, I think it helped to concentrate our minds on the need for greater interaction with other countries. So although uh, on the, in some respects, for example, we still don't have our landmark trade, EU-India trade agreement, um, and that, we, that could be transformational, uh, but we have been able to work at, uh, between the EU and India on other issues which uh, are, are of strategic importance for India. I'm thinking of things like uh, the uh, cleaning up uh, the Ganges or working at the level of water more generally around the country, uh, having our companies interacting with the Make in India paradigm, which brought new possibilities because although at the, uh, on the face of it, in the immediate, uh, immediate look, one might think, well, this is actually a protectionist approach. But compared with what had been, pre been there previously, actually what it did is to offer uh, a clear set of rules for engagement of European companies that has led to an increase in the engagement. So European Union is not, uh, has not been a, a present and is still not present in, as far as I can tell, in India's strategic thinking, but it is very much present. It, you know, it's very much in European companies that are at the forefront of India's engagement with international companies. And I think uh, this is, it has been possible to harness this in a manner that is more systematic. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the EU-India uh, relationship and um, and as I say, uh, you know, I, I hope I didn't play any role in holding it back earlier. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did not, and I think you, you served very well. You laid the groundwork for what followed, and I'm sure as the Defense Minister of Portugal, you've done the same in this new assignment. Hopefully, in January next year, when we host the Racina Dialogue, uh, we will still receive you as the Defense Minister, <laughs> and you have promised to come back if you are uh, uh, there. Uh, please join me in applauding the uh, Minister for his intervention. <laughs> and